This is Startup to Storefront. NFO, nipple freakout. If you know, you know. In response, Cake's Body has created the world's first grippy, not sticky nipple covers. They grip by your body's natural heat and have no annoying sticky adhesives. It's a real problem all women deal with. So when they began sharing the products on TikTok, videos started to take off. They sold out of their entire inventory after one viral video, and then it happened again, again, and again. The founders have tapped into something much larger than just silicone nipple covers. Today we talk with Olivia, Taylor, and Casey, the owners of Cake's Body. We discuss how Cake's Body is more of a movement than a company, how they've built a community of hype girls, and how TikTok drives 90% of their sales. Without further ado, meet Cake's Body. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to the founding team of Cakes. Thanks for coming. Thank you. For people you. who don't know, what do you what do you guys do? What's the company? We sell nipple covers. <laughs> Mic drop. So oh. we are going to give a little background because I'm guessing that you wouldn't be a consumer of our product, even though you're very familiar with Cakes. My wife does love your product, but that is true. I love them too. I'm very so much. glad. <laughs> um, so we were just sick of the pads inside of our sports bras. And I'm sure you know from doing your wife's laundry or anybody who's done a sister or a wife or a girlfriend's laundry, the pads are always falling out. And then you just cannot put them back and they're never smooth and they were just a mess. So we designed the first seamless, reusable, washable insert designed specifically for workout and swim. Wait, I need to give more background for men as well who might be listening. So the alternative, if you don't have these pads, is NFO, nipple freak out. So I used to go to the gym with coworkers in my workout tops and I'd throw the pads out. And it was super embarrassing working out with nipple freak out with my boss right next to me on the treadmill. So just context of like, this is a very simple but annoying problem for women. And, but at some point, so, so there's a ton of problems out there that you guys are intelligent enough to solve. And so why this one? Like why, just walk me through the step of like, I'm annoyed by this. The, the boss story hits, it resonates moving to how do we solve it, moving to getting family on board. Let's go through some prototypes. It's one of those simple ideas that starts out as a joke in a sense. Like it was just like you end up in so many embarrassing situations, like at the grocery store after your workout and you're in the freezer aisle and you're like racing home or it was just almost so comical that we would just, it was when we were very active on Snapchat like 10 years ago. We would just send funny Snapchats to each other. And we talked for years about designing a solution to this problem. And um, I also think it was simple enough for us to bite off. Like we had a lot of other business ideas over the years. And we're like, OK, this is a simple and inexpensive enough product for us to take a leap and order 500 units and see if we can sell them. But how did you do that? So what was the first step in like the, either... I don't, I'm a, I'm a man, so I don't have any idea of like the, what quality am I looking for? What's the fabric? What's the material? Yeah, the so adhesion? We, the first step was finding a manufacturing partner to work with. And we looked at what was out there on the market and identified how we could make it better. And I think what's so cool about our story is we didn't completely like we were innovating, but we weren't coming up with something that had never been done at all before. We were just thinking about how can we work with someone who's making something similar and we can really partner with them and change the design to be, we made it larger so that it was more seamless. We made the shape a little bit more natural to the woman's natural shape. And then I think the part that is great for working out and swim is we took off the adhesives on the standard nipple cover and that's perfect because you don't want to be irritated when you're working out and that's how it started and we actually I don't know if I've ever told you this story but we tried to launch this business in our early 20s under a very literal name our old brand name was nipple armor and we were about to launch it's a pretty good name <laughs> It was a very literal name. There's only really so like many it. places you can go with a brand name nipple armor. <laughs> okay. But we, lo we loved it. it was and today just... it's called Cakes Body. What are the cakes? Well, so we were about to launch this nipple armor brand in our early 20s. What and year was this, by the way? This was, oh God, probably like eight years ago. So maybe... All right, 15, 16, 14, 15. 20, 15, 16. 16. Okay. okay. But yeah, at the 11th hour, when we were about to launch this business, we received a cease and desist from a large sportswear brand. Oh. You could imagine. Another him. armor one, yeah. Make yeah. Tom Brady. Got it. And then. <laughs> 
And it really set us back. We were at like a completely different spot in our lives and we didn't necessarily have the same commitment or confidence that we have now. And it set us back for quite a while and it ended up being an amazing thing because we when we finally got back to it, we developed this brand Cakes Body that is completely different than it's a, the same product, but a completely different brand. And we're finding it's really resonating with our customers and it's opened up our world to develop innovative alternatives to the traditional bra while giving back to women's health causes, which is a lot more broad and it's a lot more meaningful to us and our customers than our, in, our initial business of kind of being a joke. So what does cakes body mean? What, what is cakes? What's the cakes Where mean? did you get it from? Yeah. Well, we couldn't call them pancakes. No. Okay. <laughs> We, we started and stopped. That was such a big part of our process. I'm sure you saw that too. Yeah. And so at one point, the idea was Casey was going to start a cakes business. We loved the name cake. Like actual. An actual cakes. cake business. Oh, okay. Casey I wasn't cakes. really good at baking. Yeah, though. Casey baked one cake and she's like, I actually hate baking cakes. So this isn't going to work out. We love the ring to it. We started calling it cakes kind of because it looks like a little, a little cake. A little cake. And, then and you're delivering we, happiness. We're delivering way. happiness and yeah. we love the juxtaposition of a product that's designed for workout that's called cakes because Mm -hmm. it kind of represents the balance that we see in our brand and in our lives of we like to work out we like to eat cake we like to drink wine drink wine (laughs) i like it and so and so okay so when do you actually launch cakes like what year was it that you went into doing the side hustle we just launched at the end of january of this year 2022 okay so we've been at it less than a year let's talk about that magic moment so at some point You guys go on social media. The social media of the day is TikTok and Instagram. We launched at the end of January of this year, and we had no plan when we launched. We We had no plan and we had no money. We had no plan and we had no money. We just spent all our money on 500 units, and we were like, how are we going to sell these, but we can't be stuck with them in our garage for the rest of our lives. So here we go. So step one was we did a kind of a friends and family launch on social media on Instagram and uh, really just Instagram. And we needed content, but we also didn't have money to have a big content shoot and develop ads and all of this stuff. So So we developed our Hype Girl program, which we still have today. And Olivia has been doing an amazing job. Olivia in the building. She is the OG Hype Girl and now is managing and growing the program. And that was really a program about getting our customers to develop content for us. And it has evolved into so much more. And they've turned into our affiliates. And Olivia will talk more about it. But it's been that was kind of our initial strategy. And then it's main purpose now is to develop community but i would say like when the business really took off was in like april when taylor's tiktok career and tiktok just exploded and currently that's where 90 percent of our sales are coming from 90 percent of sales coming from tiktok before i get into tiktok because once i start i won't stop i want to say one amazing thing that happened right when we launched which just putting it out there to friends and family on instagram and facebook which we don't do anything on anymore was an incredible moment just for our own confidence of like, we're doing it. Once you tell someone you're doing it, it's Mm -hmm. like, okay, I have to follow through. I'm going to figure this out. And Mm -hmm. taking that leap was kind of, I feel like a pivotal moment of just... Wait, how how long were you stuck before you decided to do it? I mean, since our nipple armor days in 2016, we kind of had this idea, this would be a great solution. We were wearing the product and using it in our lives. And we found it was really helpful for us and would tell our friends about it and give them samples to try and... We never would take the leap. And so that was super pivotal for us. And there's this one author I love. Her name is Nicole Khalil. And she talks about just taking any action is the most powerful step in building confidence that you can take because, you know, it leads you to something amazing and gets you unstuck. And so when we put that out, friends of friends started hearing about the brand and we got our first email from our customer, which was super exciting because we're like, holy Someone you didn't know. We don't know her. Casey's like, do you know her? Do you know her? Oh my God. Wait, this is a legit customer. It's not like a mom's (laughs) friend. Yeah. And so she said the subject line was this product changed my life. And she was a breast cancer survivor. And she had gone through seven reconstruction surgeries, had so many complications with scarred skin and very sensitive skin because of just so much the body goes through. And because of the gentleness of our product being medical grade silicone um, and the size and shape provided a lot of coverage and surface area, she actually, 
it was something that didn't exist and was not our intention at all in our product. And her story really opened our eyes to a holy crap, we can really help a lot of people with this product and other products and solutions that don't exist for women specifically in that community. So that was like an aha moment. We, as, at that point, still had no idea how we were going to grow it and get the word out. What did you learn in that moment, though? And so not to remove the emotion from it, but from a product perspective, like you, you had, you're basically uncovering that you've solved a problem you didn't plan for. And, and in that, it's interesting, mm-hmm. right? So then it makes you think different about the problem you're solving. Yeah. And so what did, what did you learn about how big or how many different problems the cake's body yeah, is solving? It, it illuminated a lot for us. One that every body is so different and what it goes through is so different. And what the current industry is solving for is one size fits all. And so that was one thing. The other thing, just like from a marketing branding perspective, is like how you position and market something is just as important, if not more important, than the product itself. Because for us, for example, our product isn't so different from what's on the market, but the fact that we're marketing it to work out and swim or to breast cancer patients, that moms. is very unique. What was that? Even moms, yeah, too. Yeah, mo- breastfeeding moms. That's I have hacky sack boobs. Just saying. Like, it's something that happens after you breastfeed. It's wild. Like, you're boobs become really deflated and saggy and it's like okay thanks for telling me um I didn't know so there's like a lot of a lot of women whether you're going through mastectomies uh, menopause breastfeeding it's like all these unique changes we go through as women that we're it's it's wild like we're just not having luck with these solutions okay we're gonna keep this business for a second so sorry because my mind's firing no no it's (laughs) totally fine so i'm gonna hear more about my (laughs) hacky sacks or what (laughs) no i'm just curious so from when you guys realized you were solving different problems some of the ones you're mentioning is anyone doing this is anyone solving does anyone actually understand the problem or are you guys the only people that are sort of, I don't want to say stumbling, but you're sort of discovering the problem, all the problems you're solving, and there's nobody else understanding it, touching it. The people who are solving it are making bras. Okay. And the other interesting thing that happened is being post-COVID era, women don't necessarily want to wear traditional bras. Okay. So I think this is illuminating our eyes when we look at quote-unquote competitors in the traditional lingerie space. There's a People are innovating on the bra, but maybe not alternatives to the bra or compliments to the bra that could really help solve these problems there's this there's this theory i was explaining this to the team the other day it's like the, the whole concept of the, it's the product does a job theory and so this it's this thing it's a terrible example but this is the example they give is basically um this consulting firm gets hired to go to mcdonald's and see why people order the milkshake and it turns out like it's the same person that orders the milkshake every day and it's it's the human that goes to work at basically they start at 8 a.m and they don't want to be hungry until lunch mm-hmm. and the only thing that does the job of keeping them full from eight to noon ish is this milkshake. milkshake. It's cheap. It's convenient. It's on their way to work. It just so happens that they stop at McDonald's. Mm. And so the concept is it's not that they want the milkshake. The buyer doesn't care what they're putting in their body. It could be a banana. It could be a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's the milkshake. It's the form it's in. It's that they can drink it on the way to work. And then it's over by the time they start their day and then they're full. And so it's this concept of like your product is serving a job, right? People aren't buying the nipple cover. They're buying the job, Mm -hmm. right? And I think when you think about your business in that way, it illuminates so much. And it also makes for an incredible investor story. So one of the things I do on this podcast while I hear people talk is I'm, I'm like building their investor story. And so your investor story could start with something like, you know, COVID redefined how women think about breast care, let's call it, just breast care. And what you're doing is solving that job in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And the time is now, right? It seems like the time is like immediately right now. That's such a great point. And it's such a departure from traditional marketing or brand positioning where it's all about me and my brand and what I can do for you. And it's the focus in that example you're giving is on the customer, what's their problem Mm -hmm. and what are they solving for? And that's why, to bring it back to TikTok. Let's go. That is why you will do well on TikTok if you can position it that way versus just do an ad for your brand. So let's do it. So you let, let's talk about your TikTok. <laughs> Good morning. Buckle up, this everybody. Everyone, buckle up. Um, I did. I need to preface this with I should be going to therapy to just offload some of these thoughts because like I need to get them out. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Welcome to therapy. <laughs> yeah. TikTok yeah, changed it. our lives and yeah. business. What's the video? So the video you posted. 
talk to people about it and mm-hmm. then what it meant for your business in real terms. And I want it, it to be real so people understand that in today's environment, social media can literally change, mm-hmm. in, in your case, your life from a, a side hustle to a full-time job, to mm-hmm. a full-time business, to employees, mm-hmm. and to so many different things. And so what did you do? What, what was the TikTok? So we launched our business in January. In March, a friend who is very successful on TikTok told me exactly what to do. And I was at it for about a month. And I'll share exactly what that formula is. And I was at it for a month and I told my husband the night before our first video went viral, I said, you know what, I'm over TikTok. Even if we go viral, there is no possible way this is going to translate to sales. This It's a horrible shopping experience intentionally by TikTok. And it's not, it's not going to happen. It's not for me. There's a reason brands aren't doing this. And that night, our first video went viral. We completely sold out. And that was um, that was in May. And we have sold out consecutively every month until this is our first month fully in stock. We're on track to do a million dollars in our first year in sales. And 90% wow. of our sales are from TikTok. 90% of your sales from TikTok. $900,000. I should from also say... 100% of those sales are organic. We don't promote any of our content. It's all organic. Mm-hmm. I have a lot more to say, but I'm going to pause. And what did your friend tell you about what to post on TikTok? The number one pivotal move we made was create an, a creator account, not a business account, and use it just like you would as a creator. Mm-hmm. That was huge because people want to follow people. They don't want to follow brands. If you think about, I mean, I can't even count on one hand the number of brands I follow. I don't care what they're doing. Yeah. Um, if you think about, like, would you rather follow State Farm or would you rather follow Jake from State Farm? And I even think Jake That's could funny. probably show more aspects shout of his. Shout out to his, Jake. Yeah, shout out to Jake and State Farm. That's super <laughs> smart. But, like, they could probably even do a better job showing real Jake. 100%. Like, I'd actually like to know what real Jake is doing, not like a filtered. Right social media manager's perception of Jake. Like, I want to know what Jake does on the weekends. So that was huge. Like, A, from a content perspective, it gives you a lot more to talk about. I'm a mom. I like yoga. I like a lot of different things. And I happen to run a business called Cakes, which can help people in my similar boat. And that was huge from a content perspective. But then also from an algorithm standpoint, it's all about the algorithm. And so being able to have access to the sounds, the trends that any other creator is that businesses aren't able to access was huge. Then the other piece was creating. I mean, it's such a fast paced platform. It's if you are not catching someone's attention in the first two seconds or, and if you're not keeping their attention, they're scrolling past you. They don't care what you have to say. So creating some form of tension and hook at the beginning was huge. And one of the first ones that did really well for us was it was at the same time that the Victoria's Secret documentary came out and people were just so sick of men designing things for women based on their idea of what a woman should look like. And so the hook was name one thing, a man designed for a woman that sucks. And then I talked about the pads in your sports bra. To be honest, like <laughs> people are trolling us saying that maybe a man didn't invent the pads, whatever, it doesn't matter. That hook has gone viral and we've kind of like replicated that formula um, multiple times Many since times. then and it I, like Lexi just did one and it's yeah crazy. and it's the one of the first ones I did so cakes is one of my clients and one of the first videos I did was revolving around that topic mm-hmm. and that took off and so then we continued to go down that route and it just hit every single mm-hmm. time and so I guess the question I have for you then is What's a common misconception that people have about that platform that you think needs to be, like, cleared up? Well, I have some beef with the Wall Street Journal article. Um, What is it? What's the Wall Street Journal article? Well, I think we talked about the Wall Street Journal article. It's some leaked documents from... I really don't. I think it's a great article. It's probably the best article that's come out about TikTok versus Instagram ever. It's about leaked documents from Meta about how Instagram is so far behind TikTok and they're scrambling to do anything to save their platform. But one of the biggest misconceptions and one of the things they touched on was the idea that TikTok is the new TV in that it can get you so much reach, which is somewhat true. But their point was, but TV doesn't translate to sales. It's more about brand awareness. And that's- Because they're tuning in. Yeah. Yeah, you have a dedicated viewer. 
Yeah, you're right. And but that's a big misconception is the misconception is that TikTok can't drive sales. And it 1000% can in our experience as a small brand with a team of four people. Yeah. We've proved that wrong in the fact that the targeting is so niche. It's like better than any targeting you could ever pay for or predict or mm. with any media that exists on the planet. It's mm. unbelievable the reach and just how specific you can get with the algorithm delivering it to exactly who wants to see it. So can you give people a sense of the video that you made and then how many views it got and then how many sales, like you said, you sold out. So what did that just give give like the, the linear timeline of mm -hmm. it all? We basically have it down to for every 1 million views, we make about $50,000 in in revenue. So at the, I can't remember, that video probably got like a million views. So we made $50,000 off. Every view is worth something, right? So I'm just thinking mm -hmm. about this from like yeah. a monetization. Oh, yeah, yeah. Say what's so interesting, and I think I can say this as Taylor and Lexi and Olivia are in charge of TikTok, and I think I can say this, but what's been so interesting for me more on like the operational side to watch is the fact that a Wall Street Journal article there are holes in it and there are things that you really wouldn't know unless you are building a brand through TikTok. So I think the value of Gen Z, that's something Taylor talks a lot about, is like the value of Gen Z or someone, they don't have to be Gen Z, but someone who actually is a consumer of the platform, maybe has sold a brand on the, sold a brand on the platform. Like it is so valuable. And I think that's something that differentiates, and you know this, like Brands that are winning and nimble and able to grow and evolve. And some of these, I think that's something that the bigger brands aren't necessarily yeah. doing and leaning into. So that's just been, I think an, it'll be an interesting shift to watch, especially when you compare like some of these smaller, newer, nimble brands with the big established behemoths. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it goes back to what you're saying. So you'd rather watch Jake from State Farm than State Farm. And so if you're a big brand, this puts you in a really uncomfortable position because it means your whole marketing team that has dedicated themselves to nice photos, some nice photography, very little video, now all of a sudden has to get very uncomfortable. And so what do they do, right? And I think we're seeing it in the sense of they'll partner with EA, they'll partner with like people who have massive followings, follow the artist, follow the creator, because no one's interested in following the business. Mm -hmm. And I think the question is like, where does this end? Or where does it, where does it, what's the deduction? The deduction is everyone is their own personal brand and what you're buying mm -hmm. is them in some form mm -hmm. or their team, mm -hmm. right? I think if brands were smart, they would find someone really good internally who mm -hmm. they can hang their hat on and it's not them representing the brand, it's them and the brand is a big part of their life. Yeah. You could also do that through an influencer strategy if they're really connected to your brand in some way and it's not just like which just, people see through too people I, th see I think that's through like it. totally not it anymore it's so people are so over it yeah yeah and i think what's so just going back to your point about people are over that and they see through the influencer model i think just especially like your listeners a lot of them maybe are starting businesses or maybe more farther along than than we are but like just trusting your gut and like for us, it wouldn't have been authentic for us. First of all, we didn't have the budget in the beginning, but also it wouldn't have been authentic to us or our brand to work with these big influencers who are getting a bunch of stuff for free and going on all these lavish trips. So that was the origination of the Hype Girl program and something that I love that seems maybe obvious, but I don't think it is, is like, every platform has its own value and its own need. And yes, TikTok is for reach and selling products. And Instagram is where Olivia has built this hype girl community. And that's where we engage with our customers. That's where we really build our brand. We'll, Taylor and I will like send voice memos to customers sometimes. We'll get on a call if someone writes a DM saying something didn't work for them. We'll call them and figure out why. And it's just really... Like, it'll be interesting to see that evolve, too, because I think everyone had, like, this one-track mind of, okay, do this big influencer program and then repurpose stuff from TikTok on Instagram. And it's actually been cool to take the pressure off of selling stuff on Instagram, in a sense, and, like, focus on building the community, the community. there. I wanted to ask you guys, so you touch on something where it's, like, at some point you had no budget. Now you have <laughs> roughly a million dollars, it sounds like, for this year, and obviously you're paying yourselves, I would hope. And so what now? Now you have plenty of options and plenty of resources. And so, and this is a challenging time for any company, 
you know, how do you, <laughs> how, how do you navigate these now. channels? We just need yeah. to take a breather. Um, it's been interesting because in the span of less than a year, we've scaled it from something that we really didn't think anything was going to happen with it. We were running it out of Casey's garage and now we have a legitimate operation where we have fulfillment. We have legal people and financial people helping us make sure this is going to grow. Um, and so at this point, we're at the point where we're taking this from a product to a brand where we're living into our mission and our vision of becoming a brand that reinvents the traditional bra. So we're going full force from a product standpoint on solutions that are disrupting how people wear bras or if they're even wearing bras at all. So that's a huge piece of it. From a marketing standpoint, we are taking your advice. Diego's the first one who we called him. We're like, shit, we went viral. What do we do now? And so his advice was super smart and double down on what's working and don't get super distracted by doing what's next. So from a marketing standpoint, it's doubling down on TikTok because that is working in our Hype Girl program and growing that. That's where we're at right Let's now. Let's talk about the Hype Girl program. What is it? Our Hype Girl program. Our Hype Girl program is basically our customers who become like our best friends, like our bestie girls that we could talk to all the time. It kind of started, Casey touched on this earlier, that we started with the Hype Girl program wanting it to be like our ads. Like we wanted to push out ads of these real women talking about our product and why they like it and then hope people buy them. And that was our goal. I was sending out emails, I was sending out DMs to random people saying like, can you try our product? And if you like it, can you send me a 30 second video of why you like it? And most of the time people weren't really responding. But then I found out that I was just going out there and being proactive and posting on our stories and sending out DMs, like I said, and people were just starting to do it on their own. They were trying out the product, seeing that it was life changing if it was a mother or a young girl like me and they were just going and on their stories or telling friends word of mouth saying this is what cakes is and this is how it's different from your standard nipple cover that you have in your drawer that has lint all over it you need to try it and people were so resonated with that because they were just going on their stories and we started with our hype girl program and we said okay come join our little club and you could get commission and your followers could get a discount code and free shipping and people just started talking about it. I think the beautiful thing about it is that there's a lot of stay-at-home moms and a lot of women who maybe have exited the workforce and what we've found especially we have a community of over 200 people that are considered our hype girls and what we found we've done we call them hype girl happy hours we it's a basically a focus group where we all drink wine together and talk about what's next for us i would love to join that okay you can you are a hype girl you're a number one (laughs) hype guy and it's incredible lexi joined our last one i just couldn't believe anyone joined especially like like just think about how much effort I'm with you on it this. takes like especially yeah. a virtual happy hour I was like we of course we'll do it in person when when we can everyone's kind of all spread out so we're like let's just try this but like I mean actually registering and showing up at eight o'clock on a Monday night to a virtual happy hour like that's a big ask and the fact that people were there and engaged and excited I was like no one knew each other no one we knew went each around other. the room like it was like college. It's like a say our names. people. Yeah. yeah, it was like thirty people. And then the thing was is that we were like, "What do you guys want to talk about?" And everyone was like, <laughs> <laughs> "Basically, oh, shit, we didn't think anyone was gonna come." We were like, what do, but what what means the most to you? Like, what do you guys want to talk about first? That's and hilarious. everyone was like, "Let's talk about what's next for you guys." And that's the biggest thing. We give our hype girls commission. The money I don't think really means that much to them. The number one thing these women want to provide is their brains, their expertise, their input as a consumer. They are the experts. It's community. It's putting your mind to a really great use where you're helping this small brand grow. And it's really cool. And I think it's a testament to the fact that Olivia spends so much time. That is our whole purpose of Instagram. It's personal messages it's super personal just going off of that I think that's one thing that you guys have done such a good job with that like I really wanted to touch on because when we first started it was like 
for me, social media is not just posting a video. Like, yes, TikTok, like you can upload a video and that can do very well, but it's not just that. Like I talked to Olivia beforehand and I was like, you have to outreach, you have to like message people, you have to comment, like you're building a community and you've done such a great job with that where it has built such a loyal community on Instagram that I think some people often miss out on because they think, oh, I could just upload a photo or a video and it's done, but it's not just that anymore. So that's how I approach Instagram. Yeah. yeah, the loyalty is like, just to quickly touch on a few stories that just blew my mind of of wh- how much that can pay off is we had, before we were shipping to Canada, we had one of our hype girls who actually now is an employee of ours. She runs customer service. She took the initiative to set up a fulfillment center out of her house in Canada and she would drive across the border. She would place like a bulk order for anyone in Canada who wanted to order. If Border Patrol is listening, yeah, this just is actually turn this is off. Week. <laughs> yeah. um, she would drive across the border, go back, and ship them out, out to anyone who had ordered from Canada. They literally would ask her at the border, "What is in your trunk?" And she'd be like, "Nipple covers," and they'd be like, "Okay, go ahead." <laughs> so just, and then we've had people do like trademark searches for us, and it's just, it's. Yeah, I think it's just been really interesting to see that community aspect. We built that trust with them. Yeah. Like TikTok right. for the sales and then they come to our Instagram to find out more and we've just like built this huge trust with them. And something actually I'd be curious to talk with you about just from an investor perspective is we're working to Olivia is growing the Hype Girl program and figuring out what is next, how do we scale this and how do we make this really valuable to us and to our brand and we're working on developing a platform that allows for these women to connect and grow and multiply and just have all of these opportunities to be really I mean my analysis of this is like you can do one of two things you can treat it as a business or you can treat it as a movement and what I am feeling you guys are doing is it's actually more of a movement and what I mean by that is this so if you go down the business route and you talk to people like investors probably like me they're going to tell you something really linear. They're going to say, cool, like we talked about earlier, what's your next product? What are you releasing? What's your next SKU? And then you're going to, you're going to have like, I already see the deck. It's probably like gym wear and then right, it's like gym wear, bras, maybe you go to underwear at some point. And so as an investor, I'm like, oh, cool. They're thinking big, right? So it checks like they're thinking bigger box. And then I see that the addressable market's in there. That's a really boring word, but it, like it, it covers the box of There's the deck. There's a lot of nipples. A lot of, nip- a lot yeah, of nipples, involved. right? <laughs> yeah. And more being created every day. How amazing. <laughs> And so it's very linear in that way. And what that would mean is you'd have to raise a bunch of capital and then just what I would call like increase the things that are probably kind of boring to you, like increase fulfillment, increase distribution. The design is obviously super fun, but that's probably it. Or there's the other way of looking at it where it's like a movement. And so this is more of like you're building a foundation. Uh, This foundation has legs. This foundation puts on walks. This foundation does 5Ks right? Maybe there's a fitness component to your foundation. In that, you do the same thing. You create products that feed the foundation, but you're not feeding a P&L. I'm just saying like what I, what I pick up on in this is like, you've, you've sort of struck a chord, uh, emotional and, and you have this loyalty that's unheard of, I would say, and treating it like a business, I would think is almost insulting that loyalty. Mm. Which is a weird thing to say. I would like it's not something and so I would say and I would say a movement is so much bigger than that. Well that means a lot coming from you. Thank you. And you're a hype guy. And I am a hype guy. But I I also believe it. Like it's no bullshit. Like I I actually believe it. There's no wrong path. I should I should also say that. You could choose either one and be successful in your own right, and that's okay. I just think one is gonna be more fun for you three. Yeah, and more meaningful. And, more meaningful. And also, like, something that I'm really passionate about, I think, that you just touched on it. And I love that. I mean, I don't know that I would say the movement versus business, but I think that's such a good way to put it. And something that I'm really passionate about, especially, I, th- I think, a little bit more as a woman in business, but anyone in business is, like, being able to sell that vision and the bigger picture of what you're doing, especially as two women with a nipple cover company at the moment. Like, we have had to sell the vision of where we're going to get people to take us seriously and I could tell you like a countless stories of meetings that have completely done a 180 once we've explained the bigger vision and I mean just to give one example we had a meeting with someone who owns a very established skincare brand a man in his 
an older man, and he... He was 40. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and he, um, before we even had the meeting, my dad, it was a contact of my dad's, and he was prefacing the meeting with, oh, I'm not going to want to invest in them, blah, blah, blah. Keep in mind, we were never asking for him to invest in us. That wasn't even on the table. We just wanted to pick his brain. And we got to the meeting. We explained the business. We explained the bigger picture. And by the end of the meeting, he was asking how he could invest in us. And we were talking with someone else who was like, wow, the door was shut before it was even open. And he even gave you a chance. So I think just... Not that I'm in a spot that I like to like give advice by any means, but like I think just to your point, like having that vision and sharing that with people, especially as a new brand where it's like, yeah, we actually only do have one product out now, but this is where we're going is just so valuable. You can also fund it yourself. That's another thing, right? You don't need to raise capital. Yeah, like we're hearing all these stories of, I mean, I think Allbirds just came out with these insane losses because all of these crazy venture back companies have been losing money hand over fist trying to get customers on Facebook and Instagram. See, I'm trying to bring it back to TikTok. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's crazy because it's like, for us, Nike is a huge inspiration and he was able to just basically scale it. We've um, with his own earnings and we've taken out one loan so far because we've been in a tough inventory position a couple of times and and only tough because we were growing at the point where we couldn't we would have to buy in more inventory before we even received the previous shipment these companies are just running themselves into the ground trying to acquire customers because they have the money and to your point which was my favorite line out of any podcast you've done is creativity will win over big budgets and when you have big budgets you have a luxury to not have to get that creative and yeah. mm -hmm. ultimately you will lose it's not a luxury unfortunately yeah true. yeah a, you're it's, right it's, it's a, not a luxury it's a blind spot you're right yeah and that's why i love recessions in general because it's like um <laughs> hot take <laughs> no, it's like, up once. <laughs> no what i love about it is it's like there's like water in a fish tank and you can't see anything and then you remove the water and it's like there's all the rocks that's where you failed all your errors are just you're staring at them mm -hmm. and a recession does that it forces mm -hmm. them to see like oh what's not working in their business that they've been so good at like raising capital and so because they have more capital they think they're okay but some of them are like default dead one of the things we're struggling with right now because things have been evolving so quickly is how much time we go super focused on our existing product that is working and is selling and is allowing us to fund our business how do how do we balance that with the ambitions to grow and do all these big things in terms of product platform community how do you do it now well, I'm asking you. Well, our, our, our strategy so far was literally just do what Diego tells you to do. And that was double down on what's working, which is just sell as many of these freaking nipple covers as you can on TikTok, which is working. And it's getting us to a point where we actually have money in the bank to be able to figure out. I want, I want to reframe the discussion. So I don't I don't I want I don't want you to call it selling the nipple cover. I want you to I want you to advertise it and, and really think about it as like you're just like at some point when you started the company, you didn't understand the problems you were solving. Mm -hmm. And this one product can solve what may you may have thought was just one problem turns out to be 50. Mm -hmm. And so I would go more on like the, what other problems can this solve? And the more problems you find that this can solve, the more you will sell it. Mm -hmm. And I would create TikTok and your social media strategy around the problems that you're solving. At some point you'll say, okay, we have probably identified, and this could be like an Excel sheet, 60, 75 problems this solves and we're done now. Like, there, I don't see any other possible solution. And I wouldn't go too crazy with it. I wouldn't go like, men will use it. Like I, and maybe that's, a, that's a, like a, you know, an outlier, but I would just go like, these are the things that it solves. Once you know that, hit all those stories independently and let that in, impact your social media strategy, and then go solve another problem. Because this informs you of other problems. And then go solve those and do the same thing and just copy, copy and paste. But just make sure you're like ironclad on the problems you're solving and speak to the problems you're solving. And I think like as simple as this product is, I think that's why people get so fired up is they feel heard. They're like, you're solving this problem that I knew I had. I just didn't know like there wasn't a solution. The thing I try to do in business is really pay attention. It's, it's actually hard to do. And so what I mean by that literally is like really actually listen to what the world is telling you. Like really actually listen. And what I mean by that is not, oh, they love our product. Cool. It's like, why 
And then if you have two nodes, like one from Nashville and one from Alaska, and they're saying the same thing, like really try to understand what they're trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what they're telling you isn't nice, which is even more important. It's like, oh, they want us to change something. What well, do they want us to change? I and think that's, that's a problem that you want to solve. It's great advice. And the trolls will definitely tell you what, tic, anyone on TikTok will tell you what your product isn't doing perfectly. And that's a blessing for us. We And it's almost, it's like a bubbler. It's like people, when it's hilarious because there's, I'll just give you an example. We have this one video out now that's doing really well. And we're talking about this, it's the largest cover on the market. It's designed for triple D and up breasts. Those women are getting fired up because it doesn't also provide lift and support. Very, a few, a few chills. There's, there's, a, there's about 20% of the comments are women saying this product doesn't solve my problem. Okay. That is great information. And in the background, we're like busy little bees trying to create our lift and support solution. And there's also an amazing thing that's happening where because TikTok can be so back and forth if you let it, and that will allow you to do better on TikTok, that is one thing we've invested a lot in. We just hired someone to completely manage our comments and engagement on TikTok. So that has allowed, we've seen a huge spike in our engagement, our reach, since we hired that person. But her commenting back saying, we're actively working on it now. Thank you so much. The value in someone, A, feeling heard, B, changing that interaction to be a positive one, it oftentimes is resulting in someone commenting back saying, thank you so much. I'm going to like this video. So the algorithm brings me back to you when you come out with this. So it's a beautiful way to yeah. like change the dynamic. That's a perfect scenario of like, listen, like listen to what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. People I mean, just I, want to be heard. Honestly, too. You could even, let's take this a step further. So even if you, you solve the problems, you identify them in the sales or what they are, like you, you can make it a conference. I mean, you could make this, like it could be a super straight, you could have a social media channel. Mm -hmm. You could have these types of conversations happening all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't look at your company like a product, like a Lululemon. I look yeah. at it more of like a, a, really a movement. Like I really, I really say that, and I'm serious in saying that it's not like meant to be a compliment. Thank it's you. really like you have a you have a platform mm -hmm. that you're solving a problem and that problem can be spoken about and should be. Mm -hmm. Well, we joked we both came from big brands and they would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on these focus groups. <laughs> or <laughs> millions. Or millions. Millions of dollars. On, and I worked for a large liquor company, one of the largest liquor companies in the world. They would spend millions of dollars on research and as many of the big brands would do. And we joke, we're like, we get more valuable information from our Hype Girl Happy Hours where we gather 20 women together and we're not paying them. They, the value to them is being able to have their voices heard. So when we think about the growth of our community and the next phase of what our community is looking like, it's these really smart people want to put their brains to work and want to help us. And so it's like, we don't actually get to have to like get too creative with how we're incentivizing them. They just want to help. Well, I think that goes back to your question, which is like, what, what should we be spending our time on? And I think my answer to you is listening. And it's really that simple because once you start to, I think the problem with the human being is that you, you get really tied into doing shit. Like you're like, Oh, I got a marketing meeting every no Monday at nine. And then we talk to Lexi at 10 and then I did. And then, and that will ruin you. Like people want, they're obsessed with this notion of having a full calendar and like, I couldn't live more opposite to, than that. My, my thing is like the one, the only thing that matters in the market is listening. Mm -hmm. And then once you find a problem, you spend all your time executing on that. If your calendar's full, then cool. Mm -hmm. If it's not, you're not doing enough listening to the market, to your, to your, to your consumers. And I almost like, because our problem, our product is solving a need that we had. And we, I mean, we wear them almost every day. We don't, we don't wear bras and m many of our customers don't wear bras after getting cakes. They just are wearing their body suits or their workout tops. And it almost scares me to launch a product. That's not like I desperately need this or someone desperately needs this. Like obviously it can be done, but that's just how I view our that's, product that's development. The right is move. So I'll, I'll go back to like my bow tie company, right? So we had this bow tie company and at one point, the only thing I was thinking about was let me go on Facebook. Facebook was new at the time. Let me go on Facebook and start at, uh, like literally I could advertise and target eight, like 24 to 44 year old men in the DC area with this income, with this political view. 
that I knew was going to go to like a summer wedding in, in the Hamptons, basically. <laughs> like that was that's how crazy Facebook was. The targeting at that time. Now that's highly illegal, but at that time it was insane. And so all of my brain energy was spent on that. And instead of being like, what problem does this bow tie consumer have? It turns out it's not just the bow tie; it's the suit, right? And so we could have easily started like a the rent a tux which we almost, we like, we thought about doing that. That company blew up. That was probably a blessing. But do you see what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. we, we got busy, busy chasing Facebook bullshit, thinking that we're really smart. What's my turn? What's my cost per, what's my right customer acquisition cost. If I'm spending this on Facebook, I have arbitrage, all these like dumb words we got because we failed to start like understanding the problem. We started, we got successful and we're like, Oh, we forgot about the problem. And everything you're saying is you, the value of putting the customer first at the core of everything that you're doing. And like, I think going back to TikTok, that's what a successful TikTok strategy is. And just like really anything. And like, even we're going to be in Vogue in February or January. And um, even just like our first edit of like the copy was like, this is our product. This is what we do. And we were like, okay, who is actually reading this? And we rewrote the whole copy to be like, okay, this is your day in the life and this is where this helps you get through your day a little bit more comfortably. So I think just like that lens of how can I, it's so hard to do, I think, especially for the big brands, but I think like the closer you are to it, like how can I continue to like just be solving my customers' problems and making their life easier without feeling the need to say everything about my brand and talk about myself? We won't be able to sell anything if we're not solving a really big problem. It's really that simple. It's really that simple. It's not, let me create. people can, they just have to spend so much money and time. So some people do that. You can do that, right? right? So like Kim Kardashian can do that. She can make anything. Right. And she, because she's, let's call it earned or achieved a level, but she can do that. Smaller players with no budget think they can play by the same rules. Nothing could be more, right? Not true. Like it's like. So, so the, the little guy, the little person has to solve a problem. They have to really get good at that. And the good news for us is there are a lot of problems with, like, it's just so fascinating to me when I have never talked, we talk to people about bras and boobs all day long, and I have never talked to any, not one person who said, oh, I love this bra or I love this bra company. And there are super established bra companies out there and not, literally not one person has said that. And especially in terms of women with larger chests looking for, we're calling it, our working name is the unicorn solution because there's nothing that provides support, is comfortable, and doesn't look like your grandma's bra. So that's, yeah. I think, right now our biggest. The non There are a million bra, problems, basically. but it's yeah. like, yeah. yeah, that's, I think, something that a lot of women struggle with every day, getting dressed every day. Can we talk about how... Uh, the conversation we started before the podcast, but I had to like take a downer and just like wait. But um, about kind of the idea that we're getting a lot of feedback from quote unquote very successful people telling us we need to diversify our revenue. You need to get on Facebook and Instagram ads and all of these other platforms that we know for a fact big brands in our space are losing money on or breaking even at best. And it's just pissing me off, and I just wanted to get it off my chest, so thank you. It's tough. I mean, look, I think people will always try to fall, like, the revert to the medium on, on advice. And I think they're looking out for your best interest. But what got you here wasn't their advice. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the hard part. That's the hard part about business is at some point you realize, like, even myself, giving you advice right now, like, it's really not my place. I don't really understand your business the way you guys do, right? And so I can just give you quick thoughts and articulate things that, to me, would make sense if I were in your position from this conversation. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think most of the advice people get today are from people trying to be hired, right? So if I give you, if I give you the advice of like, oh, you should do Facebook ads, you're going to be like, do you know someone? Mm -hmm. Oh, funny, funny thing you asked. <laughs> I'm doing it for four other companies. You see what I'm saying? And so I think sometimes the, the advice people are getting, or it could just be like it worked for them at one time. Like the bow tie thing for me in 2010, that was bananas. Like it was so unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But that, that game has changed. It would be like me telling you to put more photos on Instagram. You would say, that worked once. And it doesn't anymore. Yeah. Just like this video thing, right? The video thing works now mm -hmm. and we hope it stays because it's working, but we don't, we don't really know how long this will stay. It could adjust. Yeah. Yeah. It's the wild, wild west out there. And it is a challenge to weed through the advice to make sure it feels 
feels true to you and what you know to be true and know kind of like you kind of have to take a leap a little bit at some point. Totally. But what we do know is TikTok is working and we're going to keep doubling down on it and find other It's the problem streams. that you're solving is working. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. The problem you're solving is is what is working and that just so happens to be you're sharing that story on TikTok mm -hmm. and then you're aligning yourself with people that help you do that well. Mm -hmm. That's Lexi, who's like an expert in that world where she really understands it. And so all of these factors are tying in together and you're having success, right? Like the Hype Girl program without Olivia is probably not as good. And so this is the thing. Like it's like, but but it started with the problem and then you're getting a team of killers essentially to to make sure that it's, it's reaching the message to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. It's not just like we put it out and we're done. And the other misconception about tiktok that i know lexi asked about that before mm -hmm. is like people think oh that's not the platform for me like i loved the interview right. with Britt frank who's an mm -hmm. author that you did and even i had that view not long ago to i did honest. too yeah. i so, said the like same three thing. months ago <laughs> yeah and then i was like lexi we need to get on tiktok <laughs> <laughs> please and there's something to be said for sharing in a way that feels authentic and easy and not like a big headache every time you have to pick up your phone like you shouldn't if you don't feel comfortable talking to the camera that's probably not going to be very sustainable for you yeah. but there is a way to do it that feels authentic Britt frank is an amazing author has so much value to share yeah. maybe it's like text on the screen over a beautiful video of her walking her dog or whatever it is like there's a way to do it and i think saying tiktok's not for you is like saying you're not going to do the internet in the 90s like you gotta get on get up get your fucking ass up no i'm just kidding uh, get on tiktok but it's kind of unbelievable to be sleeping on it at this point the thing that i remember about this conversation was as we were going through like the data of instagram and i started yeah. reading more research on like why tiktok but basically i started understanding why instagram is following tiktok it became clear to me like you would never want second place right and so if the social media platform is unequivocally in second place and it's chasing one we should be doing, we should be on the one it's chasing because yeah. what's happening is, and this is how I like that. I like that at like TikTok, whatever's working there is being stolen on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so if it works at the source, then Instagram will repeat it within like a week or two weeks. Yeah. And so I was like, I bet you we could get really good at being like, if this audio is trending on TikTok, how long? I want to know how long will it take before it's trending on Instagram? Sure so, enough, it was like two weeks. And yeah. so there's a cycle there. Well, that's why... Which means we're like from the future. We're like buying time. It's amazing. We are. On we're Yeah, we're time travelers. Yeah. That's why one third of the video content on Instagram is made in Instagram. Two thirds of it is made in other platforms, mainly TikTok. And that's why, because your reach is going to be exponential on TikTok, lagging in Instagram. So why would you put the time to create Instagram first content when you're bigger uh, payoff is going to be on TikTok. How did this impact your, your home life? Oh, God. Yeah. TikTok doesn't impact my home life. Are you asking how TikTok? No, like the business. The oh. business. <laughs> I was like, I think I that, that all the time. I mean, the reality of being on TikTok all the time probably does impact Taylor's home life in some ways. But honestly, <laughs> I we, I don't know that we knew what to expect. We're really blown away just by what's happened over the last year. I think we're both really fortunate to have well, supportive partners who have helped us through this stage of and this transition and the fact that we're able to not only start paying ourselves now, but also like define the kind of life that we want to live. I know I think we were talking about it maybe before the podcast, but like we don't want to have busy calendars. We want to be able to spend time with our families and and work a few hours a day and you know we're so passionate about it we'll connect on the weekends if we need to whatever but it's just completely changed these nipple covers have completely changed our lives and I think just there's a lot of value in our past like corporate lives of having that stability and all of that and I think like this has just been so meaningful beyond just the business side of it, just the connections we've been making and doing something really exciting and cool. It's, I think, given both of us like a whole new sense of confidence mm -hmm. professionally and even socially in some ways. So it's been just the best thing, not to get like really deep now, but like the best thing mm -hmm. I've ever done. It's been an amazing thing for our relationship too as sisters. Casey lives on the West Coast. 
I live in Connecticut. For now, for now. Yeah, yeah it's it was there's some <laughs> growing pains for sure, but definitely a greater sense of purpose. I think when I was at my corporate job before, and it was great, but I I knew there was something bigger out there. I just didn't have the the confidence to take that leap for a long time, and it's you know just taking that action the very first post to our friends and family. I feel like this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And I know there are such exciting and big things ahead and working with amazing people that are like-minded and yeah, just doing cool things. Like we're with movers and shakers and just so much energy. Like I told you, I need a downer because I'm like, that's awesome. I'm just like so fired up about everything we're doing, everything that's ahead, all the people we get to work with. Give people a sneak peek into your future besides the, the Vogue, the Vogue article, which is exciting. What else are you guys making? So one of our big goals is we want to become a household name. So we say instead of, you know, whether it's cakes or some other product that we're going to develop, that's going to become a household name. We want to sell our business in the next 10 years. And For how much do you know? $100 million. Nice. And we're huge into manifesting and putting our goals out Even there. Even though Britt Frank told you not to? Yeah, because you know what? <laughs> she, <laughs> we kind of joke. We're like, it's not even manifesting. Like we set a goal and we like plan backwards. We're and like planning for $100 million. So that's a different yeah. word though, right? So there's like a different different word for that. There, there probably is. I think it's, I think maybe it's how, a cross. Maybe how she defines manifesting and how we do is different, but it's funny. We're like putting our plan together for our eventual $100 million sale. And we're like, this doesn't even seem that hard. Like it's just the, the state of flow we feel like we're in now where not like, oh my God, we're like Steve Jobs. But the fact that every goal we put for ourselves that seemed outlandish from the beginning we've been able to do and it just feels like things are clicking it's like a testament to the fact that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. well, thanks for coming on the podcast guys Thank you. Really for having us. thank you for having us if you made it this far i bet you loved the episode so you should join our youtube channel membership for only 2.99 a month this gets you access to one the whole unabridged conversation two you get the episodes on monday one day earlier three you get two additional entries to our giveaways check out our instagram to see what we've given away and four you get access to seasons one through three that's over a hundred episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice what are you waiting for join